Hey everybody, this is Stephen Wiley, your host and moderator for tonight's class on Monitor Basics, presented to you by our esteemed lecturer, Raymond Jett. Raymond has been a force in the VFW arcade and retro computing scene here, running, of course, all the computer reset volunteer um, workshops and events to um, sell the contents of the whole warehouse, not to mention has been doing repairs on electronics and computer-related things for decades now. So Raymond really has the art of repairs down to a science. And so here we are in science class. The bell's about to ding. And before it does, I will pass it off to your esteemed speaker, Raymond. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Hi, everybody. I'm Raymond Jett. Uh, boy, I, uh, for many years, I would do this, and I, I would give my title, you know, technical marketing engineer and all this stuff, because... Well, you know, after almost 20 years in in uh, working for an IT manufacturing company, you know, Cisco, it, it you know, hard habits to break. Uh, I've run ArcadeComponents.com since 2005. I've had it as a, a little side business for many years. It's uh, a business where I sell a lot of components all around the world and do a lot of repairs for people. Uh, there's been a request for people, you know, it's like, hey, you know, how do we fix monitors? So I put this class together. It's not something I, I, I do as part of my business, but I've repaired so many monitors over the years. It's really, it's if you can repair one thing, you can repair another. It's just understanding the circuits that you're working on and going from there. Now I've got this little thing here, stop with the percussive maintenance. And we all know what percussive maintenance is. It's like this. You know, Fonzie hits the jukebox and gets started with uh, with the music. Now, percussive maintenance is is really a pain, and we all know it works because you, you get something, you smack it, and it starts working again. But one of these days, it's going to get worse and worse and worse until it just you can't whack it and make it work anymore. So then you're going to have to open it up and and actually do a real repair. So I do have an agenda here. We're going to talk a bit about safety. Now, I'm not going to be over the top dramatic with safety. You know, you go out to YouTube and, and you go out to uh, different forums and people will be like, oh, my God, you, you could die doing this. But, well, theoretically, yes. Um, but we'll talk more about that. Monitor types. You know, what kind of monitors are you, are you looking at to repair? Uh, we're going to talk about playing with blocks. And I'm not talking about like child's blocks but it really is the same because you know you, you build something like a house or something like that with those cards or with those blocks it, you're doing the similar thing with the monitor you have different subsystems in there and understanding how it all links together will help you understand where where to go to look for specific things you're going to look at the screen you're going to look at you know, what you're seeing, what you're smelling, what you're hearing, and you're going to look at the blocks and then you're going to make a decision of where I'm focusing my repair efforts. We're going to look at some troubleshooting tactics and there are some cautions on repairs because there are things that you could do to easily screw up a monitor. Uh, then we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time on common failures. And then we're going to talk a bit about finding schematics and some of the hardest part is finding parts for some of the old monitors. So why are we here today? Well, monitors fail. Yeah, they do. LCDs suck. There's a, a big thing in the retro arcade community uh, where people are, are like, oh, look at me. I put this LCD in this in this arcade game. Look how beautiful it looks. And everybody starts, starts dogpiling the poor guy because they don't understand that, you know, LCDs aren't original. They don't look original. And if you want your collection to be complete, you're not going to use LCDs. You're, you're going to want a period correct monitor to go with that computer, just like you want a period correct monitor to go with that arcade game. Uh, upscalers, if, you, if you're not familiar with those. Old computers, you know, you'll have monochrome, you'll have composite, you'll have CGA, EGA, you know, all these different things that aren't VGA inputs or super VGA or some type of HDMI. And how are you going to get those connected up to that LCD? Well, you would use an upscaler, but those do introduce lag. So when you're playing games, you'll, you'll find that that little bit of lag can, can mean a big difference in, in how you play. 
and they can be finicky. You'll start seeing flickering, bars on the screen, things disappearing off the screen, etc. Uh, you want to try the repairs yourself. So this is a primer. This is to get you familiar enough with it to understand where to start troubleshooting. But you don't know the first thing about fixing monitors? That's fine. That's why we're here. Uh, I will assume, though, that you know how to solder something and how to remove solder off a circuit. So we're not going to talk about soldering irons. We're not going to talk about types of solder. We're not going to talk about uh, desoldering braid solder suckers and things like that because you should already know how to, how to use all of those. If you don't, get with me offline or get with uh, any of your local friends that know how to do that kind of stuff. And uh, it's, it's real simple. So key learning objectives. You can tell I spent a lot of time doing presentations for large corporations because I've got my slides out, you know, in all these different formats. Uh, I actually put these slides like this together in a template for folks at Makerspace that want to uh, create their own presentations as well. But at the end of the section, this, uh, this whole session, you should be able to understand the functional circuit blocks that are in the monitors, map what you're seeing on the screen or what you're hearing to specific circuit blocks so you know where to start troubleshooting and where to where to find those problems that are doing things like blowing the fuses and where to order parts for your monitor so now all the basics are out of the way let's get started and we're going to start with safety first because yes safety is a big thing when you're dealing with this now there are dangerous voltages in monitors uh, you know, they, they can be potentially lethal, especially if you have heart conditions or if you have a uh, pacemaker. And it all depends on where the current goes. You know, if, you, if you're reaching a hand in there and it goes from where your hand is up to your elbow, you, you, you're fine. You're, you're, you might get a little numbness, a little tingling, etc. But if it crosses your body, that's bad. Now, I've been shocked by monitors before. This is... It's kind of like when you go to shut off a lawnmower and you got one of those old lawnmowers with the little metal tab that you got to push that touches the tip of the, the top of the spark plug and you get too close to the spark plug wire that's got the crack on it and it zaps the hell out of you. It's like that. It's like grabbing a spark plug in your car. It's not fun. It hurts and it will wake you up quickly. And with that, you have to be careful when you jerk your hand out. Now, monitors are powered by your mains voltage. So you plug them in the wall. You know, you got 110 in the U.S., 220 in Europe. Uh, on, in the U.S. side, you have a hot and a neutral. And this can be a problem if one side of the, of the chassis is connected directly in. So you could end up with a, a shock hazard. So you might need to do something like put a, uh, an isolation transformer in place when working on this. And we'll get to isolation transformers. Uh, these things can generate significant voltages. You're looking at up to 12 kilovolts for a black and white and 18 to 27 kilovolts, depending on how big the tube is. The bigger the tube, the more energy it takes when you're dealing with color. Now, your focus and your screen controls are all derived off that high voltage, what they call the second anode voltage on the monitor. Now, CRTs are under vacuum, and they can implode when damaged. And that's always kind of interesting because you know, when it happens, it, it can be really kind of brutal. And this video will show you at, at different frame rates, like this one's at a thousand uh, frames per second. It sucks inward because of that, and then the glass blows outward. So it, it's uh, pretty brutal when it happens. Uh, you, you don't want it to happen right in front of you. They have very thick glass on the front of these monitors and you you might have seen monitors where it looks like they have spots and dots and big big bunches of gunk around the edges of the tube and they call that a cataract on monitors when you see the cataract that's just the bonding of the safety glass and the glass behind it going bad so a lot of folks will go to the youtube and they'll see how to remove that safety glass and it makes it look a hundred times better but you have to be careful because that glass is more fragile now you you don't have that safety glass there to help protect you
And there's some really cool videos out there for CRT uh, implosions. I'm gonna pop that CRT. This big old vintage CRT. It doesn't have any implosion band. So it might go pop very hard. The implosion band he's talking about is a metal strap yeah. around the tube. He's removed I that. And the weak part is the neck, the back of the tube in this section. When you're dealing with the neck of the tube, you don't want to put any pressure on that. And that is part of the problem when uh, you're dealing with monitor repair. There's always that weight. So, always fun to deal with. Now, keep a hand in your pocket when you're in the monitor working and measuring voltages. Anybody want to tell me why? Shock that doesn't go across your heart to get both hands in there. That's a big part of it. What's the other part? What's your reaction when you get shocked? Yeah, yeah you're gonna fight now. Muscles. You, you're gonna you're gonna jerk your hand away. That's the biggest thing. You're in there with the probe, and it's like zap. You know, the, your first response as a human, programmed into you, an instinct is to jerk your hand back. So you have one hand in your pocket because you don't want that shock to go across your heart and you don't want to jerk back with both hands. One hand's bad enough, but when you're jerking back, what's going to happen is anything that's in the way of your hands is going to, is going to go flying. Your, your probe's going to go flying. And if those hands are anywhere around the neck board of that monitor and they go flying back, you just snap that neck and you just degas the monitor. You, you, you let in all the air and that vacuum is gone. You toasted the tube and it's no longer any good. So those are the, the two reasons to keep your hands in, hand, one hand in your pocket when measuring. Now the other part of that is discharge a CRT, wait a few minutes and discharge it again. Why? So the tube is like a big capacitor and when you discharge it, you're taking all those electrons that are that are uh, as close to the tube and they just rush out all right so the the big thing is is when the when that happens you'll hear a crackle and it, the tube will seem dead but the problem is is it when you discharge it it's very unequal and there's still a charge on parts of the tube and so what will happen is that charge will redistribute around evenly on the inside of the tube and so you discharge it again to get rid of more of that energy that's left in the tube to help render it safe for handling. All right, monitor types. So I'm just gonna say typical, let's not split hairs with this because we all know there's all kinds of weird stuff out there like 24 kilohertz composite monochrome monitors from HP. My son had one of those. That was an interesting find because what do you hook it up to? That HP, that's it. <laughs> And uh, TI Professional PC had strange monitors the same way. But uh, the most of the common stuff you're going to find are going to be like uh, TTL monochrome or composite color slash monochrome for your old vintage computers. Uh, when you get even to the super old ones with composite monochrome and composite color, you'll see these SO239 connectors. Think CB radio and ham radio. Those are antenna connectors but they use them for video on the old one. So you would use an uh, what they call a PL259 to RC, uh, RCA female as the adapter for that so that you can adapt it down to the normal little RCA phono, not phone, but phono, P-H-O-N-O, -O, plug to plug into that composite video jack. Now you also find BNCs. This is common on your PVMs, your Sony uh, uh, professional video monitors. 
Then we get into our favorite old school computer monitors. You've got the TTL monochrome, you know, your what they call MDA, monochrome display adapter, or Hercules video. You'll find that on uh, the old PCs and PCXTs and the ATs. Then you get into the composite color. Uh, sometimes you'll find a, a monochrome card that will output com uh, composite. TTL color. So your CGA and EGA. TTL is just transistor transistor logic. It's a type of IC chip slash voltage levels for a zero and one. So it's like zero to 0.8 volts is a logic zero. Anything above 2.8 volts is a logic one. So it, you're, you're looking at a bunch of square waves coming out instead of analog where it varies the signal. And as it varies, you get different color intensities. The analog color you'll find at 15, 24 kilohertz, as well as 31 kilohertz and above for when you get to VGA and SVGA. 24 kilohertz, that's EGA frequency. 15 kilohertz, that's CGA frequency. In the arcade world, you'd find that as standard, medium res, and high res. Fixed frequency, those are typically going to be analog inputs. Fixed frequency is when you get into those specialty monitors for CAD systems and uh, high-end Unix uh, workstations like SGI, etc. Uh, Multisync, we know that's an NEC brand, but Multisync just means it's a monitor that can sync to multiple frequencies. So when you get into VGA and SVGA, you know, 640 by 480, 800 by 600, 1024 by 768, you're getting into different frequencies that, that the horizontal and vertical circuits run at. Now you'll have different types of plugs on these monitors and you can tell what they are by looking at the plug. So if you're, if you're missing these first three pins that uh, you only have the first two, but you don't have the rest of these on the first row, then you're looking at something that's going to be a monochrome monitor because the color, you've got three color pins on that top row. Similar with the uh, VGA, the VGA, you've got red, green, and blue as the first three pins. And you can see they've only got one pin in use there. That's your VGA monochrome. The rest of them populated, then that'll be your color monitors. B and C inputs, you'll find these on a lot of large workstation monitors or, or high-end uh, VGA monitors, like your uh, uh, Idekiyamas and um, some of the high-end Sonys. You'll find those. 13W3, I included here just simply because you might see that every once in a while. That's going to be on... Uh, typically a Sun or an SGI, a high-end workstation monitor. Uh, some IBMs will have that. If you see that, uh, just think, unless you have a specific use for it, pass that up. You, you don't want that for your collection. Unless you know somebody that wants it and you can use it as trade bait. Now, open frame monitors. Open frame monitors are monitors that have no case, no plastic case. So you're looking at something that could be rack mount. It could be in a metal case because it's going to go into a special housing for industrial use. And they're typically going to be industrial monitors. You'll find them in, in medical devices and in industrial devices in uh, milling machines and things like that. Vector monitors. I'm sorry. It's all open frame in the arcade machines too. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, you, you won't typically find anything except for the earliest black and whites where they used TVs that had the inputs modified. Uh, you'll find uh, those or those none of those will have cases. Vector monitors, think oscilloscope. Oscilloscope, you have X, Y inputs, and those directly drive the X and Y yokes, and you have a beam on the screen, and then you're moving it with the X and Y yoke. And so you're just drawing figures on the screen. Uh, vector monitors are typically going to be arcade use. Uh, you will find some in some very old machines using very high persistence monitors. Tektronix had some, but you'll typically never mess with those in the computer world unless you're really, really into extremely old arcane machine. Not arcade, but arcane machines. And what about S-Video? Just think of S-Video as composite video already broken out. You get your chroma and your luminescence as separate signals going into the monitor. So not really going to spend much time on that. The only time I've really seen this in the computer worlds with uh, Commodore 64s. 
Now the monitor guts. Let's take a look down inside. So it's like a surgeon cutting for the very first time. Yes, I, I did sneak a Weird Al reference in here. Now, with this, this is an IBM 5153. This is the CGA monitor. We've got a switching power supply here. We've got the deflection yoke. This is what does the job of directing the, the electron beam that's coming from the CRT neck out to covering the whole screen. On the back of this tube, we have this gray coating. They call that the DAG coating. You'll find a wire going around the outside of this tube, uh, or you'll find little metal fingers touching the tube, which is what the IBM's using. And what that is, is that's bleeding off the static charge off the back side of the tube to ground. Otherwise, it will build up until it builds up high enough to jump a gap like a... Um, oh, I'm trying to think of the... Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the little static electricity generator. You, you hold on to it and your hair stands out. Van de Graaff. Van de Graaff. There we go. Thank you. Where your friends come up and they touch you from behind and you're jumping going, ow, 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 every time. Yeah, what will happen is it will jump to the nearest ground point and you'll hear occasionally a little pop, pop. You turn out the lights and you look and you'll see a little spark going from the edge of the tube down to the circuit board. Very bad thing to have happen. So that's why they have this coating on here. The convergence rings, and there's also purity rings here. These are little rings. They're very flat. It's hard to see them in this picture, but you'll see them once you get in and look. Those are little magnetic rings that you can turn ever so carefully and adjust where the beam goes on the screen to converge it so your red, your green, and your blue beams hit the same spot at the same time like they're supposed to and give you a white color. That's where you start seeing things with color hazes around the edges as things come out of convergence. We'll talk more about convergence later. Uh, your input cable for your signal, your power cable, the neck board, very fragile thing, a neck board. You don't want to hit it because it's on this CRT neck. The CRT neck is very fragile. Uh, I can't state that enough. It's very fragile. That's the, the part of the tube that's easiest to break. Flyback transformer, you can always find the flyback transformers. It's got the big red, thick red wire that comes up here to what they call the second anode, the clip on the side of the tube. This is the big shocky owie part that you're going to slide the screwdriver tip under to discharge it. Uh, focus block is built into the transformer on a lot of monitors. Sometimes it's not. And you can see here on the IBM, it's not. It's a separate thing. So it takes the high voltage and it divides it out and gives you your focus and your screen voltage to drive the tube. Yoke wedges. These are pieces that help stabilize the yoke on the back of the monitor and help keep it to where when you get it lined up to the front of the monitor and you get it adjusted up and down slightly, ever so slightly, to get your convergence where, where you want to start, then you got to clamp it down carefully because if it's too tight, you'll crack the neck. Too loose, it moves and then the wedges hold it in place. Lot to go over in a short period of time. So let's play with blocks. Steve-O, you've got a lot of these around your house with the, with the, the kiddo and uh, Hugh Fisher, new daddy this past week. You're gonna have these very soon all over the place. But blocks are a lot better to step on than Legos. That's all I'll say. Playing with blocks, why should I care? Well, it's going to help you understand where to start troubleshooting. When you have a problem, you want to know where to start looking. You, you don't want to start looking at something that's totally not related. You don't want to be wasting your time in there and trying to you know pull your hair out, trying to figure out you know, where this problem is when you're looking totally in the wrong circuit. So if your monitor is blowing fuses what would you check? And I'm going to give you a hint here. You're not going to check the input. You're not going to check the video buffering circuit. You're not going to check the vertical oscillator, the vertical drive, the horizontal oscillator, or the video amp sections. What sections are you going to check? You're going to focus on the B plus power supply and horizontal output. Now, the way this works, monitors have two power supplies. Always remember that, two power supplies. The first power supply is what they typically call B plus when you're looking at a monitor manual. 
And that's referring back to the ones that have the analog power supplies where it comes in. It's rectified. You go th through the bridge rectifiers, of the diodes. Then you go through the capacitor to smooth the voltage out. And then you're going to a circuit that's going to regulate the voltage to a specific level. It's got a little pot in there that you can adjust it slightly because, you know, we all know things change over time. And then that runs the horizontal uh, oscillator and output section. Now, the oscillator does not pull enough power to blow a fuse. It's just not going to. If you look at the schematics, you'll see resistors in place that are high enough value. And if you use Ohm's law and you calculate the current going across those, it's not anywhere near enough to blow a fuse. But that horizontal output transistor and the safety capacitors around it, when those short, that's a direct spot for that to blow. If one of those main rectifier diodes shorts, or if your voltage regulator shorts, those are all things that would blow a fuse. So that, that you're going to focus your attention on those sections and not all those others. So you're immediately going to narrow down where you're going to spend your time. Now, question for you, what section would you start with if you had a flat line across the center of the screen? Exactly. You have a horizontal line. You're going to look at the vertical deflection section. And we'll get more into that as we go. So let's look at these blocks. If we look at a monochrome monitor, you've got your input section. So you have your TTL video and you have an intensity signal. So intensity just, it gives you a dim or bright green, amber, or white, depending on the color of the, of the phosphor on the tube. You've got a separate vertical sink, separate horizontal sink, and a ground. So you've got five signals going in, and then it's going to separate those out. You're going to have your video buffering and your video amp, which is going to drive your video output. It's going to drive the pins on the tube to give you your, your um, electron beam that's going to poke at the screen and light the phosphors. But then also you're going to have your sinks going out to the vertical oscillator and drive, which is going to give you your vertical deflection. And then you've got the horizontal oscillator and the horizontal drive and the horizontal output, which is going to give you your high voltage and your horizontal drive on the screen to expand that out. Now you notice over here it says screen, focus, heater, high voltage. When I mention that there are two power supplies in a monitor, your power that gives you your B plus voltage, your horizontal output off that high voltage transformer, that flyback transformer, you will have taps off of it that will give you other voltages to run things like the video amplifier, the vertical drive, etc. So you have to have your horizontal output and your high voltage working to have voltage for other sections of your monitor to work. If you're missing voltage up here, you're not going to check your power supply here. You're going to check the power coming out of your flyback transformer. They'll have little resistors, high-speed diodes, and capacitors coming off of it to give you the DC voltage off so that you can run those other sections. Now, these diodes are high-speed diodes. You're not going to replace it with a 1N4007. You know, that's a, that's a standard 1-amp uh, general purpose diode. It's not fast enough. It will fail. It will fail fast. Almost a blink of an eye in these very high frequency applications. Because remember, horizontal sync, 15 kilohertz, 24 kilohertz, 31 kilohertz. That's the frequency of that voltage coming off that tap on that flyback. So you have to use what they call shot key type diodes. They're very high speed on the order of uh, nanoseconds recovery time. Things change a little bit when we get into composite monochrome monitor. You notice most of it's the same. Let me go back one slide. You see the video buffering. Go forward a slide and you see the video buffering move because we have a sync slash video separator. Composite video has all your video coming in. So we're going to separate out the sync from the video and hand off the horizontal sync to the horizontal oscillator, the vertical sync to the vertical oscillator, and we're going to hand the, hand the video off to the video buffer. So very simple, very much similar to 
the building blocks for the other monitor. Now we jump over here to the CGA EGA digital color monitor and it's very similar to what you saw on the TTL monochrome except we're tripling some of the circuits. So the horizontal oscillator, we still have that, still have horizontal drive, still have horizontal output, still have the video buffer, the vertical oscillator and the drive and the video amp, but we have video buffers and amps for red, green, and blue colors. So we have one for each of the color drives that we have going to the tube. So if you're missing red, always start an input. Do I have a bad cable? Do I have a bent pin on the cable? Do I have the signal coming into the monitor? I do. Okay. Do I have it coming out of the video buffer going into the video amp? Do I have it going out of the video amp to the tube? Am I missing voltage at the video buffer or at the video amp? See, it, it helps you to narrow down where you're going to look if these things are missing. So building blocks are always very important with monitors. Now the multi-sync, we're going to get a little bit more complicated. All right, so we have maybe an analog slash digital switch because we're switching from an analog input to a digital input. We have the video buffer, we have the video amp, all that stuff's the same. Uh, but when we have the sync coming in, then we have a sync detection circuit to help us decide you know, how fast do we need to run this? Do we need to bring in other circuits, the compensation circuits to adjust? You might find some of your multi-sync monitors, you'll hear clicking of relays in as you switch modes because it's switching other parts of the circuit in or out. Then we'll have the horizontal oscillator, horizontal drives, the horizontal out, the vertical oscillator, and vertical outputs. Now these get a little bit more complicated because you have those compensation circuits to help it adjust as necessary for the higher and lower frequencies of the different signals coming in. So other than that, it's still as similar as the other monitors. VGA analog color monitor. Okay, when we get into VGA, you don't have that. You know, you're you're looking at 640 by 480. You know, boom, it's done. Now, when you start getting into multi-sync monitors for VGA, when you start getting into SVGA and XVGA, 800 by 600, 1024 by 768. You know, 1280 by 1024, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you'll start getting into some of the compensation circuits, et cetera. Uh, but when you're dealing with a, just a plain Jane IBM PS2 VGA monitor that does 640 by 480, it's rock dead simple. You know, you've, you've got your red, your green, your blue, your horizontal sync, your vertical sync, uh, and power. You know, everything is similar to the other monitors. The big difference between analog and digital, if we go back to the digital part, you'll see an intensity. The intensity is how we can take three lines and get 16 colors. So if you if you look at your, your binary, you know, you, you count binary, you've got zero, one, two, three, uh, four, <laughs> five, six, seven. So zero through seven. And then this gives you another eight of those for 16. So that's how you get light blue and dark blue because you're dealing with the intensity to brighten things up. Now sync signals are going to come in a variety of sources depending on the monitor, depending on the computer. You might find something that, uh, you know, on your composite video it's all combined with the video signal and sent out. Uh, you might find uh, sync separate from the video. Uh, you might find separate sync with different polarities. Or you might find sync on green. Sync on green just means it's on the green signal. You find that a lot with workstation monitors. Now, I mentioned earlier, not all monitors are created equal. Uh, you'll find custom monitors. I already mentioned the 24 kilohertz composite monochrome that my son had that was an HP monitor and the stuff from the TI Professional PC. There were a lot of AT&T 6300s unearthed at Computer Reset, and those monitors were special. They also used a DB25, if I remember right, interface, which is an oddball interface. Uh, we, we already talked about the 13W3 connectors and 
Uh, the large fixed frequency monitors typically are going to require special custom video cards. And I've got a little note here for Mac and CAD slash CAM. So when you're dealing with CAD and CATIA machines, you know, like your IBM RISC machines, etc., they have these huge 19 to 24 inch monitors that uh, operated with very specific video cards. Your Macs, uh, video cards were to, the resolution you got was typically determined by what monitor you plugged into it. So you'd plug a monitor in and have ID pins. It'd tell the computer, I operate at this frequency or this, this uh, resolution. And then boom, you would have it. Uh, that's why you would often see uh, specific video cards for a Mac were paired with a specific monitor and sold as a set so that you can make sure that everything plugged in and worked. Apple tried to make things brain dead simple for the Mac world. So you, you want a new new video card uh, to display higher res? Yeah, you're gonna need a new monitor that'll display that higher res. So you'll, you'll find that when you start looking at Macs with new bus cards and uh, things like that when, when you're collecting what they call uh, low end Mac, you know, the old 68K or fat Macs. Uh, on uh, you no, on uh, Facebook, there's a group called Low End Mac for Mac collectors. So if you have questions about those old things, you can you can jump in there, and they're very helpful. Now, if you have a composite sync, again, those are going to have to be separated out in the monitor. So you're going to have that sync circuit that's going to strip it out into the separate horizontal and vertical sinks. Now, VGA ID, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because the majority of what you're going to see is the old stuff with the old monitors where you have different polarities for your horizontal and vertical sync. And that's what tells the monitor to switch to different modes to go from 640 by 480 to 800 by 600, for example. Now, over time, those have migrated. Uh, you'll find two pins on the old monitors. They migrated to four, and then they, they've got an IIC bus, uh, I squared C. Um, that gets into uh, uh, way beyond basics. So just remember your, your sync polarity changes to change the monitor resolution. So if your monitor, you plug a monitor in and you go to change the computer to 800 by 600 and the monitor wigs out, well, it probably can't understand the sync change, and you probably just have a simple VGA monitor that can't do SVGA. Now we talk about building blocks, and this is why it's important, because even the manufacturers do this. If you go to look at your monitor, and you look at the silk screen on the circuit board, you'll see all these different labels on the parts. C being for capacitors, D for diodes, Q for transistors, IC, well, for an IC chip, L for an inductor, etc. Now, each one of those is going to have a number range around them, and those number ranges are going to differ for the different parts of the circuit. So if we look at this schematic on the screen, this is an IBM 5151 monochrome monitor. The schematics came from Sam's Photofax, and we'll get into what Sam's Photofax are because they're your friend when you're dealing with uh, vintage monitors. You'll notice that the different portions in here, like the video buffer section, all the parts are labeled... 2XX. So you got Q201, Q202, Q203 for your transistors, your horizontal section, your power section. Each one has its own range so that when you look on the circuit board, that gives you an idea of, hey, I'm troubleshooting something. It's in the horizontal and the horizontal on this particular monitor is labeled as 700 series and you're looking and there's a part next to it that's in the 300 series, you can go, yeah, that, I can ignore that part because that part is not in the circuit I'm looking for. But it's very easy on the silk screen to look for that. And that helps you out if you don't have schematics because if you can identify the portions of the circuit based on the, the what you see there. So if you look at, it, at an IC and, and you look it up and it's a vertical output IC and you see that's in the 500 series, then you know everything in 500 series is going to be vertical. And that's where you you would focus your attention if you were having problems with your vertical deflection. So that's why we spent so much time on blocks is because understanding how the, the monitor is built by blocks, by function blocks, helps you understand that, hey, these circuits are laid out by these function blocks 
And this helps me to, when I go to look at things. Now let's talk a bit about some troubleshooting tactics. Now the building blocks, they, they are friends for helping narrow everything down and helps you understand where to look and where to spend your time on this repair. But your senses are also key. When I was a kid, I had an uncle who had a repair, uh, a TV repair shop. So I started out in electronics because I had a uh, black and white 19 inch TV. Mom said if I could find a TV that I could buy myself, I could have one for my room. So I found it at a yard sale for $2. Worked great for about a week, week and a half, and then it died. Well, I had an uncle who's a handyman. So he came up, we took the tubes out of it, took it over to the local drugstore, found a bad tube, picked up a new tube, came back, put the tubes in, Boom, TV worked like a champ, and I used the heck out of that. I had my Atari plugged into it, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. You know, that way I didn't have to mess with the TV in the living room and bother everyone. So I was hooked. But then I had another uncle who had a TV repair shop, and he helped me learn the finer points of troubleshooting. And part of that is, is using your senses. So what do you see? What do you smell? What do you hear the circuit doing? When you turn it on, do you hear the whining of the uh, high voltage transformer. 15 kilohertz, you can hear it until you start getting too old. Uh, I'm in my early 50s. I can still hear a 15 kilohertz uh, whine on a transformer, on the on the high voltage transformer. And it's also funny because when the kids are around, you know, and you get these teens that, that think they're, they're cute because they have those super high pitched ringers their parents can't hear, yeah, I can hear them. <laughs> but don't, ta don't taste it. <laughs> And why would you want to be very careful if you touch it? Because some things hold a charge. Some things definitely hold a charge. What else? Could be hot. <laughs> Absolutely. Could be hot. That's one thing that, that uh, I've done over the years in checking arcade game boards is just, you know, just very carefully touch things and I've gotten to where you just kind of just go like this and just barely do it because uh, you know for a while there you know you take the back of your fingers because that's your most sensitive part and you just run it over the chips like this but if you get a shorted ram it doesn't take but maybe five seconds for that thing to get hot enough to blister your finger and then all of a sudden you had a big blister back here on the back of your finger just ask on the uh local retro computing group how many people have gotten blisters from some of the hot chips and uh yeah it, it's it's actually painful and it will be a reminder for about two weeks as it heals uh, look at the circuit do you see caps with split tops do you see caps that have wet spots under them if they have wet spots under them then they are leaking and there's if you see a cap with a glob next to it like if you look on the picture you'll see these these uh, this glue here you'll find a lot of large caps have glue on them and no it's not a leak it's just glue and the glue's there to help keep the caps from moving because when you have large caps on a circuit board and you jar things those caps will move if they're not fastened down with some glue and what will happen is is the legs on the bottom side of the circuit board are going to move too. And if they move the wrong way, you know, if they move this way, you'll crack the solder. If they move up and down, you could pop that pad off the circuit board. Now, game boards, computer logic boards, that's very difficult to do because those are typically high quality uh, fiberglass circuit boards. When you're dealing with monitors, you're dealing with a lot of that compressed crap circuit boards the phenolic stuff and the circuits are laid down with epoxy and and it's not very strong and so it's very easy to lift or pop a trace off of those using too much heat or physical force so you have to be really careful with that so that you don't damage those but that's why there's glue now the glue what happens if it darkens what's so bad about dark glue anybody know it shows that it got exposed to some kind of heat. Well, the heat is an indicator typically uh, of why it got dark, but what's the problem when the glue turns dark? You can't see through it. <laughs> no, you, that's not it. Somebody popped it up in chat. It becomes conductive. conductive. 
And so the darker it gets, the more conductive it gets. And so this picture came from sound-au.com and you can see the, the glue is a very light tan color and then turned yellow and a dark brown and then almost black down here. And the darker it gets, the more conductive it gets and it will cause problems in the circuit because you'll have paths for signals that the factory never intended. So when you see the glue like this that gets dark, you need to chip all that crap out of the circuit. If you need something to hold the, the part in place, what do you use? Do you use hot glue? Do you use RTV? I'll tell you right now, you don't use hot glue. What about staples? <laughs> staples. Oh, that was easy. Now, I actually have repaired a few different arcade game boards over the years where somebody actually soldered a staple to the board and had it running out to the edge connector to be a replacement for a lifted edge connector pad. <laughs> yeah, when it left my shop, it was repaired properly. The, uh, the glue becomes conductive. You remove it, you need to stabilize the parts. If you use hot glue, those circuits get hot, the glue gets runny. You don't want to use hot glue because of that. RTV silicone is great for that, but the problem with RTV silicone is that it leaches acetic acid. What's acetic acid? It's vinegar. And what does vinegar do to electronic components? It corrodes the leads. So you got to be careful with that. Use RTV, but use the stuff you get at the aquarium store. It's low volatility. It's low VOC, low volatile organic chemicals. Uh, that's the one you want to use if you need to, to tack some of that stuff into place and keep it in place. Look for physical damage. And you can see the bottom picture. This came from one of our computer reset volunteers, Andy Goth. This is an IBM PC junior monitor. And you can see there are a couple of cracks there pointed out by the arrows. And you can see the patches he's got going around to patch the traces. Uh, sometimes these cracks are very hard to see. And monitors, you'll find cracks because they didn't always support the circuit board properly from the factory and the flybacks are heavy. And if you jar it, especially in shipping, you'll end up with cracks. You drop it on your desk, maybe an inch or two, and you could crack a circuit board. So to fix these, you can jump her around them. What I like to do is right here where the crack is on the big traces, scrape all the green coating away, tin it, and lay down a large piece of solid gauge wire and, and like a, an 18 gauge solid and, or multiple 20 or 22 gauge solid wires across that to physically hold the pieces together. And then you can go over it with some non-conductive epoxy to help hold it in place further. Do that with the larger traces and then just do the wire jumpers to uh, patch all the smaller ones. And that'll help keep everything held together and get your circuit back fixed. And what I mean by uh, translight means shine a flashlight from the backside. You know, you're holding the circuit board up here so that you can see it, shine the light through it, and you will see the cracks. They will light up from the flashlight, and you will see where those cracks are, and then you'll know, oh, crap, that's what the problem is. That's actually a mod from a Hercules monitor. Oh, thanks, Andy. I forgot. You you sent me that one instead. That... Um, when you're dealing with, uh, how hard was it to find once you once you lit things up? Well, I, I, I don't know. It was, it was a problem at first, but I'm like, yeah, you know, maybe I should use my eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't need any extra light. That's a pretty gnarly crack in the top left, as you can see. Yeah. And the one on the right was a little harder to spot, but uh, once I had my eyes open to, oh, wait, this board is cracked all over the place, I found it in no time. Yeah, so... Uh, you can see the lot of the larger cracks, the smaller ones. It does help, and it will save you time if you if you light it from the backside because they will they will stand out like a sore thumb. Uh, look for dark spots on the circuit board. That's where a component got hot. So where a component got hot, yeah, it might have changed value. Now it could be a large wattage resistor uh, in that area, but it could also be something that smoked and fried. But also look at fried resistors. Resistors don't have to be burnt to a crisp to be bad. Now, I will tell you this. In all my years, in all my years of working with electronics, I have never seen a resistor go down in value. They always go up. Semiconductors go down in value. They short. 
And when they short, it's typically half ohm or less, unless they go leaky. When they go leaky, they can be hard to find because that means they just failed slightly going the other way. But uh, that could still cause you to have problems like blown capacitors. And you replace the capacitor and the new one blows quickly. And you look and double check and make sure that you didn't put it in backwards. What happens if you put a cap in backwards? So. Yeah, Matthew knows. He, he, uh, he did that. <laughs> he posted about that. It went pop. Yes, it's uh, not fun. And, um, oh, sometimes, it, usually when you have a reefa cap go in a power supply, you know, those, those just fail due to age. They smell real acrid, really kind of sharp, nasty smell. But when an electrolytic capacitor goes, uh, it typically smells like a fishmonger's dumpster. It smells like uh, old fishy cat food, you know. It's just, it's really gross. So you, you don't want your shop stinking like that. Also, when you have leaking caps... And you go to desolder them off a board like an old Macintosh, and and uh, or if you're into the PS2s, and you have to de recap those boards or the hard drive or the floppy drives. You touch the lead, the soldering iron to it to melt the solder. You'll hear a little sizzle sound. That's leaking electrolyte. And then you go, ah, oh, because it will smell nasty. Fishmonger's dumpster or the dumpster behind a Chinese restaurant, you know, where they serve a lot of fish. Yeah, that's the primary odor, fish. It's just really gross. All right, test repair equipment needed. Good quality multimeter with insulated leads. And I cannot stress this enough. Stay away from Harbor Freight and Amazon specials. Because when you're looking at the, the plastic on those leads, the insulation, they're very thin. And the, uh, the cheap meter that you see on the screen here from Harbor Freight says it'll read up to 750 volts AC. Look how thin the insulation is on those probes and make a conscious decision. Do I really trust that little amount of plastic to insulate me from 750 volts? Hey, uh, Raymond. Yes, sir. Uh, so if somebody... If somebody uh, owned a cheap Harbor Freight or Amazon special multimeter and wanted to get one that was useful for working on like an IBM 5153, what would you recommend? Asking for a friend. <laughs> Anything that has a decent brand name. You don't have to go hog wild on spending. I, I tell you what, I've got some amazing pieces of test equipment in my shop. And guess what? I've been doing this since 2005. So I've had many years of scrounging and looking, Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, OfferUp, uh, surplus stores, pawn shops, uh, just looking around yard sales, estate sales to find some of this gear. So if you're looking for something like a name brand, like a Craftsman Meter or Klein or Fluke or Tektronix or Agilent, and I know those last three are crazy expensive, but... You can actually find some of those really cheap. You can pick up a fluke meter for 40 or 50 bucks if you're, if, uh, yeah, if pawn shops or Craigslist. Uh, pawn shops, some of them don't bargain. Some of them do. It depends on how long they've had it. You'll find some pawn shops like Cash America, they automatically drop prices on things over time. And so look at the dates on it, come back at that date, see if it's there. And if it's there at that price you want to buy, buy it. Uh, there are other things that you can get like Greenlee and, and other brands of meters. Just you know, Radio Shack. Find an old Radio Shack digital multimeter somewhere. You can pick those up for a song. You know, just stay away from the ones that when you look at the leads, they're crazy thin. You know, those, those type of leads are, are the ones that you're going to get shocked by. And, uh, if your leads are bad, you can pick up a new set of leads cheap. Okay, uh, just you, you can find them in, in a lot of different places. But the thing is, is don't go the cheapest route when it comes to a multimeter. Hey, um, when I started working in the department I work in now, they said that we had to use uh, something that was called a true RMS meter because it had better components. Is that something to look for? No, uh, when you're dealing with true RMS measurements, you're, you're going to get something that's going to measure things just a little bit differently because you're, 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 I wouldn't bother with it for what you're doing here. 
you know, you're not dealing with lab grade equipment and you're dealing with something that um, if you're looking at Sam's Photofax and, and the other schematics where they show voltage at different parts of the circuit, they're reading it with a standard multimeter. They're not reading it with true RMS. They're not reading it with anything super fancy. They're, they're looking at what's the average technician going to have. Now, isolation transformer. What you see on the screen, that is a TR110 from BK Precision. That's if you want to get really fancy for isolation transformers. Uh, if you need an isolation transformer to power a monitor, ask any of your friends that are big into arcade games. They probably have a couple laying around that they'll just give you. Isolation transformers are just a one-to-one -one transformer. you got a Gozinta and a Gozalta. That's the same voltage on both sides. The big thing about that is that when you're dealing with it, it isolates you from the power company, from that side. It's a safety thing. Uh, it'll help protect you when you're working on that live chassis. And it's something you absolutely want when you're digging into the internals on a monitor. An oscilloscope, or oh wait, a small towel. Why a small towel? Small towel has two purposes. Well, I mean, you always need one if you're going to be hitchhiking across the galaxy. Absolutely. I was hoping that would come up. I love geeky references. What's that? In case you have to throw in the towel, maybe. <laughs> Don't give up that easy. Bingo! There's one big one right there. So you can lay the front of it down and not scratch it up. What's a second purpose for a towel? As you're pulling parts off the monitor, screws, little brackets, you can set them on the towel and they won't roll around and roll off the table. And they'll stay in place so that when you go to put things back together, you know which parts go where. That's pretty genius. I've never put screws or anything on a towel. That's that's a, that's a great hint. That... I, I just throw everything into a cup and forget about it. You lose them all at once. I tend to use a magnetized uh, uh, cup. I try to stay away from magnets when working on monitors. Uh, just so that I don't accidentally magnetize screws. Um, monitors do weird things when you're dealing with magnetic fields. So I try to keep that as far away from it as I can. Uh, I, I don't go as far as, you know, magnetic screwdrivers. If they're really strong magnetized, I don't use them. I use a different set of tools just because I don't like dealing with a lot of magnetic stuff around the, uh, the picture tube. I don't want to have to go back and, and possibly degauss something later. Which is also why you don't put uh, big speakers on your bench when you're listening listening to music. Set them off to the side. You know, don't put them right next to the tube. Oscilloscopes optional. I don't expect anybody here to go out and buy an oscilloscope or to learn how to use an oscilloscope to to fix monitors. An oscilloscope is going to be for advanced repairs when you're looking at trying to figure out something that is buried down into the circuit that's really operating oddly. But when you look at the SAMS PhotoFax, they have a lot of pictures in there that show you what signal you should expect to see on the oscilloscope, oscilloscope screen at that point in the circuit. A grounded temperature controlled soldering iron is a must. Uh, set it for 650 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't set it any higher unless you're working with lead free solder, which I don't recommend. It's the tool of the devil. Uh, you <laughs> you want to use leaded solder. Lead-free solder can be a real pain in the neck. Um, I even use leaded solder when fixing computer motherboards. I'll, I'll uh, heat it up and mix a little bit of leaded solder with the unleaded solder because it makes it easier to desolder the circuit. And uh, usually after two or three times of, of adding solder and removing it, you'll get the hole cleared a lot easier. But that's a different story. Desoldering iron, solder pult pump or a desoldering braid, tools that you'll want to use to remove solder from the circuit so you can remove a part. If you want to measure a resistor, uh, I recommend you pull one leg out of circuit. Diodes, eh, I, I usually don't because diodes fail shorted in the vast majority of cases. Uh, but sometimes you may need to lift a leg of a diode even in a circuit to check something. If you're in an area that has a lot of transformers and coils, like your horizontal drive, your, your horizontal and vertical yoke sections. 
you may need to lift a leg because otherwise you, you'll be measuring through other parts of the circuit and you may think something is bad when it's not. So make sure you have something there that allows you to take the solder off the circuit so that you can pull that part and maybe test it out of circuit. Uh, common hand tools, duh, uh, and a signal source to drive the monitor. Something that's going to give you a test screen so that when you reassemble everything you want to test it, you can make sure that everything looks good. Now, if you clean with water, make sure everything's thoroughly, thoroughly dry before you power it up. I'm in Texas. I don't know where everybody else is here. I know most of you are going to be in Texas from the local uh, DFW Retro Computer Group, but we invited some folks from my Arcade Components Group as well as the Computer Reset Liquidation Group so there may be people from other parts of the world on right now. So uh, in Texas, we just set it out in the Texas sun for a couple of days and let it dry. <laughs> Problem solved. But you can use simple green. You can use liquid dish soap like Dawn or Ajax. All that's safe to use. You can get water all over the monitor, all on the circuit board, everywhere. Just make sure it's thoroughly dry before you plug it in. Use a good soft paintbrush. You can, you can scrub slightly with the paintbrush to get the dirt out of all the cracks and crevices and make everything look beautiful and new and clean and makes it a lot easier to see all the crap that you want to see like corroded component legs because of that stupid glue or where something was spilled into the monitor. Uh, look for resistors that um, look like they've been burnt through. Things like that become a lot easier to see once you get all that dirt and crap off. But don't use a high pressure spray because especially if you still have the neck board on the monitor, you don't want that high pressure pressure spray to hit the neck board and break your tube. So you got to be careful with that. Gentle water. Don't clean. Oh, yeah. And the CRT socket and focus block. Don't get them any more wet than you need to because they can, they can be very difficult to dry out, uh, especially on the, um, the tube. That socket where the focus, where the uh, the screen wire goes into the tube, you'll see there's the round socket, and then there'll be this square block that a wire goes into, and inside that square block is where the screen voltage is applied to the tube, and when you have that, uh, that's going to be very high voltage, and water can get trapped in there. So make sure that it's thoroughly dry. And when you're doing this, remember that DAG ground I talked about, that coating on the back of the tube? Don't scrub that coating off. That coating's there to help bleed off that static charge that builds up on the outsides of the tube. And you'll have a DAG ground wire that's typically around the back of the tube or it's little fingers on the edges that connect to it that are grounded. Either way, you don't want to get rid of that coating because you will screw things up. Uh, that wire, if it's got a wire on it, that wire typically connects to the neck board. So that'll be something you have to unplug if you want to remove the neck board. Just make sure you put it back when you reassemble the monitor. So you want to avoid damaging that coating and avoid forgetting to hook that ground up because number one, you don't want a floating ground wire inside the, the, the monitor. But number two, you want to bleed that charge off the back of the tube so you don't have that arcing. Traces, I already mentioned, are easy to damage on monitors. They're single-sided circuit boards in the vast majority of the monitors you'll work on. Uh, heat will cause things to fail. And physical stress, like I mentioned, you can lift pads off of it. Uh, improper installation of components, leaving capacitors above the circuit board with the leads above the circuit board can cause problems because when they push down, you know, you, you set it down, you let it drop a half inch, and all of a sudden that that capacitor pushes down, it can pop that circuit, that pad off the bottom of the board. Now, this board has probably already been cooked. You've got hundreds to thousands of hours of operations over the years. And so the pads, the, the epoxy to hold the pad in place is already going to have some damage. So it, it, some monitors, they, you just solder something on and you pull your, your iron away, you'll see the pad just come right up. Uh, that's how bad some of them can be. I've seen that in uh, some of the uh, arcade monitors I've worked on over the years. So you can actually do some repairs for this. Uh, if you want to use epoxy, 
use high temperature epoxy. You don't want to use super glue because what is super glue? Something cyanate. Yeah, cyanoacrylate. You know, it's, yeah, that cyano part is something you don't want. You don't want to sit there and heat it up with a soldering iron and breathe any of those vapors. Sorry, that is not a good idea. So use a, a high temperature e epoxy. Something you would get, you know, like if you were going to epoxy something like uh, a piece to a carburetor on a car. Something, you know, that's going to expect to last in a, in a hot, nasty environment. Like a JP Weld? Uh, that's that's a one thing you could use, but you're going to be mixing such tiny amounts. So uh, be careful what you use. Uh, I, I tend to prefer the liquid epoxies when you're dealing with trace repairs because uh, you have to get such a thin amount on that. That's hard to do with the paste epoxies. Now, copper trace tape and uh, snipped off component leads, those are your friends in fixing damaged traces. Copper trace tape, you can find that on eBay. You can find that on Amazon. Uh, it'll typically have a little bit of stickiness to it that you can stick it down, but it's not high temperature by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it lifts very easy, but you can get one end soldered down to the existing trace, one end over there to where you can get the component lead soldered to it, and it'll stay on the board. Uh, RTV silicone, we already talked about, making sure you use a low VOC type to hold those parts into place. That helps stabilize that area after after you uh, repaired that uh, that lit that component trace. We already talked about not using hot glue. If you have dirty pots, use the right stuff. MG Chemicals Neutral. Use that. Don't use deoxid. Don't use WD-40. They're not made for cleaning pots. Cleaning pots, you have to clean them and lubricate them. Deoxid's going to get rid of that. Now, if you if you use uh, the deoxid fader, that's supposed to be for pots, but I've never tried it, never used it in monitors, uh, so your mileage may vary. But don't use the, the standard deoxid everybody has because that is not meant for pots. And I know that's speaking to Ford versus Chevy or different types of religion because people are like very passionate about their deoxid. Um, I don't like anything sprayed in that does not belong in that particular circuit. Old monitors equals brittle plastics. So the biggest thing that you can do in saving your monitor is to turn the screw backwards until you feel a little thunk of the screw settling into the existing threads that are cut into the plastic and then slowly insert the screw. If you just take the screw, jam it in, and start turning it, guess what? You're going to be most likely cutting new threads into that old brittle plastic, and the first thing you're going to hear is crack. You're either going to split that round cylinder of plastic you're trying to screw into this way, or you're going to split it this way and lift it off. And when that happens, you're screwed, but not too bad because... You can use something like PC7. PC7 will stick to most plastics. Works great. Uh, I've used that to fix Vectrex monitors. Uh, I loaned that out. Did uh, Steve-O, did I loan that out to you for years? Steve-O stepped away from the computer. Uh, he's a new daddy too, just like you. He, he's got his second baby there. All right. You recommended that PC7 stuff to me when I had a Model 12. The uh, mounts for the CRT had actually been broken in shipping. That stuff, that PC7 stuff is awesome. It actually hardens like concrete when it's done. And still to this day, the, the thing's holding together very well. It, that's yeah. awesome. The, I love yeah, the stuff. A, I've used it on a few things too. I got, a, I got PC11 here and PC7. And uh, it's been great. It's awesome stuff. It, it hardens and you can tap it if you if you wanted to get that precise with it. You can go drill it, yeah. tap it. That circular saw that looked like it had been driven over. I fixed that with PC7. Yeah. That, that stuff is, uh, to me, it's miracle stuff. And it's non-conductive. All right. Common failures. 
Whew. Everything from It's Dead Gym to Missing Colors. So we have a lot of different things here to look at. Do we see a washed out screen over bright, light gray ha haze over everything with diagonal lines, solid color on screen, shaded vertical bars, moving humbar that moves up or down the screen, poor color alignment. We can see the, the red and the green shadows around things. Uh, horizontal line, vertical line, poor focus. Focus keeps changing. Pin cushion, color blotches on the screen. Vertical rolling, horizontal tears or horizontal rolling. Partial vertical collapse. Noisy speckled screen. Arcing or popping sounds. Or missing colors. So all of these things, uh, this, this slide probably took me the longest to create. Going out and, and getting pictures and um, editing the pictures and building this out and then putting the failures on top of it. <laughs> when it comes to building slides, that, that can sometimes take you forever. So let's just jump right in. Hey, Raymond, we had a quick question from not another project real fast. Sure. Yeah, I was just kind of curious on that um, partial horizontal collapse. Does that um, directly translate to uh, like a partial vertical, excuse me, partial horizontal collapse versus partial vertical collapse? Would those be kind of like the same symptom for, from a different side of the uh, uh, signal path? Yes, we'll get to that. When I get to, I got slides for you, every one of these. Thank you. You're welcome. And just to let you know, we're about halfway through everything on the deck. So per, common failures, percussive maintenance. We talked about it earlier. It is a thing. You're going to look for the cracked solder joints. Even NASA fixes stuff with percussive maintenance. You, you go out and find the article. NASA fixed Mars InSight lander by making it hit itself with shovel. It actually is a real thing that NASA did. Uh, if you're a Deadpool fan, once I kicked my TV, didn't work, so I kicked it and it started working again. That's percussive maintenance. Here you can see this solder joint's good. This solder joint, you see a clear ring around it, and this one, you can see another ring around it. Those are cracked solder joints. That's what you're going to look for when you have percussive maintenance. You're looking at something where the solder's broken, you slap it, and it jars it, and it gets it to working again. To fix it, you may need some magnification to find it, but you'll see the ring around the pin. You'll see it. When it gets really bad, it'll be uh, black around that ring from arcing of current flowing through that. You'll see that sometimes on the flyback transformers and other higher current parts. Uh, you might find a part where the solder didn't stick to the leg properly. This is a rare thing, thankfully. I had a Space Invaders uh, arcade game board on the bench, and one of the sounds was bad. And replaced the LM3900 quad comparator. That normally fixes it. Nope. Checked all the resistors. They were all in spec. Uh, replaced the Tanslim capacitors, because when they start to fail, they can do that. Nope. And then I just happened to bump the cap and it moved. And I'm like, what? And you can see the solder joint and it had the peak solder and everything around it. It looked perfect, but you could slide that leg in and out of that solder joint. So re-soldered it, took care of the problem. Now, when you have the cracked solder, I recommend you remove the old solder. So use your solder pulp, pull the solder off, add solder to it. Uh, sometimes you'll find when the solder gets cracked and cooked because of heat, uh, you know, the electro arcing and stuff, and you see it looks black in there, you might need to add a little dab of rosin flux. GC Chemicals also makes a little bottle of rosin flux with a little brush applicator. You just dab a, just a just a small amount, enough to just wet it with a little bit of rosin, and you'll hit it with the soldering iron and a little fresh solder, and boom, it'll flow beautifully. And then you can remove that old solder off and put all fresh on it. Next, it's dead, Jim. Start at your AC plug and work your way in. Is the fuse good? Is the power switch good? And do you have continuity from the AC plug to the power switch? You know, maybe your transformer went open. Rare, but it could happen. Maybe your fuse blew. 
check your fuse with the, um, sorry, Google's trying to tell me something here. Okay, check your fuse. It doesn't always look bad. The fuse can have a little crack in it. I've had a monitor where the fuse just blew, you know, and that happens. You know, they get hot running and then suddenly the metal fatigues and it fails. If you have a shorted component, you'll see that fuse will be black inside where that fuse element in there just violently vaporized and is coating the glass. Now, when we're dealing with the 5153, which is what we're going to focus on on all of this, this has a switching power supply. So this is going to operate differently than a lot of stuff you're used to. So you still have this section right here where it comes in from the wall, goes through the bridge rectifiers, goes through the big capacitor, and then there's your, your B plus source. So 153 volts. Now we go through, if all of those look good, now we get to look at the switching power supply section. So the 153 volts comes in, and then we have our voltage, our, our goes out. So we have a 20.9 volt source, and we have the 115, which is the main voltage that runs everything. So is the power supply blowing fuses? If it is, we're going to have to check this main switching transistor because the, the 153 volts comes in right here, goes directly through a coil to that transistor down to ground. So it's pulsing that voltage through the transformer to ground. And as it pulses, we're getting the output on the other side of the transformer. And so if that shorts, then suddenly that 153 volts goes straight to ground through that part and it blows the fuse. If the power supply is chirping, listen carefully, you'll hear a little tick, tick, tick or a little chirp, chirp, chirp type sound from it. You've got a short circuit. When that happens, these switching power supplies will go into shutdown mode. So then you have to find the shorts as to why it's doing that. If it's not doing that, then it gets a little tougher because you're going to have to look to see, is this thing even oscillating? Is it pulsing? You know, maybe the B plus adjust pot down here is bad. Maybe the fusible resistors here have opened. These are safety fuses. So it's possible they could have opened. Maybe one of these diodes shorted down here. Also check on the output side if you have a shorted anything that this runs. So horizontal output transistor in this case, the, uh, the high voltage section, you know, the drive. If that's shorted, the power supply will be in shutdown. If one of these diodes on the output that filters the, uh, the voltage that um, converts your AC to DC, if one of those goes bad, then that will also put this drive section into shutdown. Will, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I actually have a specific question about um, that blinking or chirping or clicking. Yep. Um, I've actually got a Mac portrait display that it pulses a raster and then fades away, and it just does that over and over and over again. Is that a sign of... I, there's no schematics for it anywhere, so I'm kind of having to figure it out as I go. Is that potentially indicative of a switching power supply fault? That's a tough question. That one's going to be something that's going to be a little bit more advanced. Because what you're going to need is you're going to need a high voltage probe. Mm -hmm. And check the high voltage and see if your high voltage is doing this as it, as it goes. Okay. If, if it is, you might have your high voltage going too high and it's going into a high voltage shutdown. Okay. You have high voltage shutdown circuits in a lot of monitors. That helps prevent the tube from being overdriven with voltage because what will happen is it will generate x-rays and make be a hazard. Yeah. yeah. The glass in a CRT is leaded, and that helps filter out the normal amount of x-rays you've got coming out. That's also why CRTs are considered hazardous waste. Yeah. But if you overdrive it, then you're going to end up with uh, an x-ray emission problem. So you may end up having something like that where you have something failed and the high voltage is going too high and then it's going into shutdown and it just keeps doing that. Okay. Is it, 
The LED on the front comes on, so I know power in some respect is good. So that makes a lot of sense that it might be more of a high voltage problem. Is the L is the LED flickering on and off too? No, it stays solid. Okay, then I would suspect it's going to be a high voltage shutdown issue. So mm -hmm. uh, bring it over to the shop. I've got a high voltage probe. You can put it on my second bench and, and take a look at it. Cool. Okay. Mike, my guess is your B plus is too high. Well, and I don't even. I, I need to find somebody that has a working one so I can even determine what that is. Because <laughs> as with anything Apple, there's just nothing out there on it. Uh, I, I know some people. We, we might be able to find some schematics. Send me the model number of it. Cool. Yeah, we'll do. All right. So next one. Are you missing a specific voltage from the power supply section? So when you're dealing with these monitors, if it has a switching power supply, you'll notice that the switching power supply has multiple voltage outputs. The main 153 is there, but we also have this 20 point something volt source down here that's driving some parts of the circuit as well. So this will drive the lower voltage on your horizontal oscillator. This one will drive the uh, your uh, horizontal output transistor, you know, the, the flyback transformer, etc. If those are good, but you're still missing some voltages elsewhere, this is where you look at the output of the high voltage transformer. So this is a snippet of schematic. I've erased all the drive sections and the, the high voltage section that goes out. But coming off of that, you'll see there are different sources. So we have the 20 point something volt source uh, coming off of uh, your main power supply. Uh, but coming out of here, we have all these uh, fusibles that come off. And you'll see one uh, 115s, you see 12.78. Now, all of these are okay. Then your problem's going to be off the flyback. So the flyback will will show you on the next, I think it's the next slide. Anyway, you have two separate power supplies that you have to look at. You have your main B+, and in this case, switching power supply on the 5153. And then you have your, your one coming off of the flyback. Now, is it still dead, still blowing fuses, still chirping the switching power supply? I mentioned the horizontal drive and output sections. So here we're looking at, okay, what voltage sources do we have coming in? We have the 115 volt. We have uh, different components in here that could be causing the problem. So our main 115 comes through this coil, through the high voltage transformer, over here to our horizontal output, out to ground. Now you also have these snubber capacitors around the transistor. This helps absorb transient switching spikes. And you might also have a damper diode here as well. The damper diode helps block some of those transient spikes as well. So these are all components that you wanna to check to see, are these blown? Typically it's going to be the high voltage side here the 115 volt side capacitor or the transistor shorted that's causing you to have that chirping problem. Now over here, this 115 volt, we know the problems on the 115 volt, but why is this labeled green? Why, why do we not care about this side of things? It's connected to the 115 volts. But what's so special about this that we're, we're going to ignore this when you're in shutdown? This is on the other side of the transformer, a T401. No. Good guess, though. Look at your resistor here. 115 volts goes through 4,700 ohms. You're going to limit that current going through there because of that resistor. So you're, you're not going to draw enough current out there to blow things. So your, your big problem is going to be in this section when you're, when you're blowing those fuses and the power supply, the B plus power supply is good and your switching power supply is good or in shutdown. So that's R416. That limits that current going through. So that's why you're not going to bother with looking at your horizontal drive if it's blowing that. Now, what would a shorted drive transistor do? If this horizontal drive transistor shorted and not operating, what would, what problem would you have? Might just have vertical line on the screen. Nope. 
What do you have to have to have a vertical line on the screen? High voltage. Yeah. This oscillates over here and it drives this transistor, which drives this output transistor. So this is a drive and this is your final output without the signal coming across this transformer to drive this transistor. You'll never drive your flyback and you'll never have high voltage. So if everything over here looks good and you swap out your horizontal control, you know, oscillator output IC, and you still don't have a drive, check that transistor. If it's shorted, yeah, you'll never get the signal over here to drive this one. Now here's the flyback. We see the high voltage range. Uh, we can see the voltage taps coming off of this. All these little resistors in here are all going to be fusible resistors. So what will happen is you will have uh, a vertical flat line. And you'll come back and you'll go, okay, I'm missing this voltage source. Um, oh, let's just pick this one right here. Say, so we're missing this. Okay, if you're missing this, then you've got a fusible resistor out here. And not only are you missing this, but you're missing these others as well. This one, this one, and this one, this one. All four of these are driven off that fusible resistor. Now, what typically will happen is you'll have a failure at one of the, the high-frequency diodes. And when that happens, this diode down here, when that happens, you'll have... Uh, the uh, um, capacitors over here will pop. The fuse will blow. And you'll end up with a flat vertical line. We'll talk more about that in a bit, the flat vertical line. But you'll come through, you'll replace the diode, you'll replace the caps, you'll replace the fusible resistor. And you'll power it up and you'll cross fingers that your horizontal or your vertical output uh, IC or transistors are still okay. So you, if you have a dead video amp, something not working like that, or your vertical output, always check the power. If you have power missing from those sections, check these taps. And I'm going to harp on something, and I'm going to say it again. If you have high voltage, your main power supply, your B-plus power, your switching power supply, your horizontal drive... Your horizontal output sections are all working. I can't tell you how many times I go on to the Arcade Game Repair Help Group and see people saying, like, I got this flat uh, line on my monitor. And somebody will go, check your horizontal output transistor. No. No, 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 no. If you have something showing up on the screen, you have high voltage. If you have high voltage, you have horizontal output working. Look at something else. To see what the failure is. How do you know if you have high voltage if you don't see a picture on the screen? Say your your ver your video amp is out. How do you know if you have high voltage? Static. You'll hear that crackling static when you power it up. Put the back of your hand to the monitor and you'll feel the static on the hairs of the back of your hand. So yeah, if you have high voltage, those sections are working. Look elsewhere. Is that pretty much a guaranteed thing with CRTs that uh, uh, all the voltages are going to come out of the horizontal output? Yeah. Okay. That's one way to boost efficiency and lower um, power wasting. You know, They're going to derive it off of that. It's also cheaper than uh, going in and putting in a, a really fancy power supply to give you all these different voltages. All right, over bright with diagonal lines or poor focus. Adjust your screen and focus controls. So when you have these controls, you will have, uh, usually a, a flat bladed screwdriver will fit it. I would use a well insulated one just in case you have something failing in that thing and you don't want to get zapped. Adjust it and use a mirror. 
you know, you, or have somebody over there say, okay, stop. Oh, back up a little bit so that you can make sure you get it set right. Uh, you can't always reach around the back and adjust things and look at the front, especially when you get into larger monitors. So a little mirror will be your friend. Put a nice something on the screen so you can watch it and turn the focus. You turn it too far, it goes blurry. Turn it back, it'll get clear. And you turn it too far, it'll get blurry again. The screen, the, the screen control is what gives you your uh, kind of like a brightness drive. Uh, when it gets too high, the screen will get grayed out and you'll see those bright retrace lines showing up. So turn the screen control down. Sometimes you'll find a black level control. If you turn the screen control down and it's too dim, look for the black level control. If you don't have one, then possibly your flyback's failing or your tube is weak. Now, let's talk about focusing failures. If you have something that's very slow to warm up, if it takes forever to warm up, you could have a bad CRT. Now, if, it, if, it's, if you adjust the screen control and you get everything looking pretty and you turn it off and you turn it back on and everything looks pretty, but over time it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and still it's gonna wash out the screen, you know, you could say, okay, maybe the CRT is bad, but uh, if you have a CRT tester slash rejuvenator, you can check, check the output of the tube and see if it's the tube or not. If the tube is good and it still takes forever to warm up, it's a bad flyback. I have two monitors over here in my uh, game room that are in a, uh, one's a, a Merit Megatouch upright bar game. And then the other one is the same thing, except I stripped it out, put a new computer in it, made a touchscreen jukebox. Both of them would take about 45 minutes to get up to full brightness. Check them with the tube uh, rejuvenator and the, everything looked great. So replace the flyback, boom, nice and bright. Everything works. The focus keeps changing. You could have a bad focus block, uh, which may need to, you may need to replace the flyback. But if, if it's out of focus and you can't quite get it into focus, if you turn it all the way to the end of the focus block and it's still not quite in focus at either end, uh, replace the focus block. But if you can get it into focus and it just won't stay in focus and you keep adjusting the focus block and it keeps drifting, then that's going to be your CRT. Sergio, go ahead and come off, off of uh, mute and just ask your question. Okay, so I have a b b little security monitor that it takes like five minutes to uh, to brighten up and also to, to, to get it to focus. When I start it, it's completely unfocused and dim. But after about five, ten minutes, it's perfectly, perfectly sharp. Yep. So, so the, to be able to really tell the difference if it's, uh, if it's the picture tube or if it's the, uh, the uh, flyback, what you can do is if you have a high voltage probe, you can check and see what the voltage is going to it. Uh, if you have a CRT tester rejuvenator, you can check the emissions of the tube. I have both in my shop. So uh, if you want to take the uh, part number off the side of the picture tube, you know there'll be a big paper sticker with a big string of numbers on it. Uh, send me that string of letters and numbers, and I'll look to see if I have the adapter to fit my CRT tester to that particular tube. If I do, you're more than welcome to come over and uh, we'll check and see if it's the tube. If it is the tube, we can hit the button to try and rejuvenate it, but there's a small risk it could uh, render the CRT you know, a brick. And that gets us to this part. What would you use to test it? Huh? Test your rejuvenator. BK Precision 470, that's what I have. Uh, 466, 470, 490, um, 480. Those are all good pieces to use. Uh, Syncor makes some. I couldn't tell you which models are the good ones to use, but you can find that online. Uh, I would stay away from Heath kit ones because they're just going to be massively old. There is a risk when you try to uh, rejuvenate this the picture tube because what you're doing is is you're you're sending some voltage down to uh, the elements to try and burn off a little bit of the old coating and try and refresh it a bit. But uh, you, you, you could burn through the elements of it. 
So that's something that you could try as a last joint, last ditch effort to do it, but be aware there's a risk that you could brick it. Uh, if you brick it, then you get no picture anymore. All right, solid color on the screen. So this is typically going to be a short on the color output transistors. On uh, these, you'll typically find them on the neck board. If you have a, a monitor that has just a socket with wires that plugs into the back and no big neck board, then they'll be on, on the board around where those wires go for the different color guns. Now these, you have to be very careful in working around because they run hot. Some of these have big uh, high wattage resistors around them as well. Some of them have undersized heat sinks and you'll see the circuit board will be very dark around them. When that happens, the, the traces are very easy to lift. So you have to be careful with that. Uh, if everything checks good here, if all the transistors check good, nothing looks shorted, you have all your voltages, and everything looks all right, you may have a short in, in the uh, picture tube in the neck itself. Uh, a CRT tester rejuvenator, you can use that to try to burn through the short and restore the tube to working operation. Other things, if you're missing colors, uh, check that fusible resistor that you'll find on that final amp on the neck board. Also check solder issues at all connections. So you've got your inputs. Look at your cable. Is the red pin bent, broken, missing? Well, yeah, put a new end on the cable or replace the whole cable. Is the, does the color come and go when you move the cable? Replace your cable to the input on your monitor. Look at the solder where the cable connects. The, quite often the solder will crack there. Then uh, look at the capacitors and stuff in the, in the circuit path for the video. And then finally get up here to your final amplifier and check to see if you have voltages, etc. Now, if everything checks good, you could have a weak color gun on the monitor. I had one that uh, came out of a pole position that had uh, weak emission across all colors. Did the rejuvenation and turned out beautiful. Had another one that was missing green and red, rejuvenated it. The green came back beautiful. The red never did come back. So that tube was toast. That one we had to just do a tube swap and put a different, different CRT in it. But that CRT tester slash rejuvenator will help you ferret out if you have a bad tube or not. Uh, it's not something you would use very often. So what I would do is if you feel the need for, for testing a, a picture tube, put out a request on uh, some of your local Facebook uh, groups for computers or for arcade games and see if anybody around you has one that you can use. All right, so let's combine a few things. Moving humbar, pincushion, vertical shaded bars, partial vertical collapse. These are typically going to be bad capacitors. Uh, some cases also with horizontal collapse. You'll also see vertical fold over where the top of the screen looks like it's folded back over on top of itself and the very top of the screen is displayed upside down. And as you adjust vertical height, make the height bigger, it goes further down the screen. When you make it smaller, it comes back up and wraps back around. When you start seeing that, you want to check and, and look at your caps. Stay away from caps on Sampo, Rubicon, all those cheap caps. Now, people might say, Rubicon, they've been around for years. I don't like them. I've used Rubicon caps in uh, things that, you know, I, I needed 105 degrees Celsius things. One of them was a um, in-focus projector in the power supply. So I put a Rubicon cap in. It didn't even last six weeks before the top split open. Uh, I use Nichicon, I use Panasonic slash Matsushita, United Chemicon, you know, top tier cap brands. If you're looking for caps uh, and you want to buy in bulk, try Online Components. They are a distributor for Panasonic, Matsushita, Nichicon, etc. And uh, I find that they have the cheapest prices if you want to buy in bulk. By bulk, I'm talking like 100 plus caps at a time. Color blotches on the screen. All right. This is de dealing with magnetiz magnetization of the picture tube. 
I can't tell you how many times as a kid I would sit there with the magnet going, ah, this is cool, look at what does the TV. And luckily it never stuck, because if it did, number one, I'd uh, gotten probably a few whacks. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, back then it was different than raising your kids now. But anyway, that blotches of color on the screen is typically what happens when you have magnetization of the picture tube. On arcade games, it can be just as simple as turning them 90 degrees. Uh, it could be that you have a speaker nearby, or if you have an arcade cabinet, you put the wrong speaker above the monitor. You needed to have a magnetically shielded one, and you put a standard car speaker in there. Uh, or you're using your home stereo speakers next to your computer monitor, and uh, that will cause you problems. Fan motors, AC units, Breaker boxes and fuse boxes. You have your computer on the wall and the breaker boxes on the other side of the wall. That can cause problems. Uh, you do have a degaussing coil built into monitors. You'll see it around the tube. The, uh, the problem is, is it only lasts for a couple seconds when you turn the, the picture on, the tube on. You have a thermistor in there, in the circuit, and the thermistor quickly increases in value. So it quickly throttles the amount of current flowing through that coil. Because remember, a coil is just a straight piece of wire, just a lot of wire wrapped around, but a lot of current will flow through it. So it limits the amount of current and then quickly increases in value, which drops the, the, the flow of the, your voltage and current going through that coil. So it doesn't ever create a big enough magnetic field to really remove strong magnetization from that tube. So what you're going to need is you're going to need a degaussing coil. Don't go buying one of those degaussing sticks or one of those little eight inch coils off of eBay from China. Don't do it. Total waste of money. If you're going to do this, do it the right way. Uh, you can use a GC Electronics uh, high power degaussing coil. Probably cost you about 45 bucks. This is the kind that's got the power switch on it here. It will last you a lifetime. You take it, you switch it on, and you go like this to the front of the tube. You go like that to the sides and the top, and then you pull it back a few feet. You turn it to a right angle, and you let go of the switch. It will get warm when you do this because it's a straight piece of wire, and it heats up with all that current flowing through it. So that's why they have the switch you hold on to make it work. You know, you can't latch it on. It doesn't stick on. You hold it down while you need to use it. Now, in a pinch, you can use an AC drill and do the same thing. Just walk, you know, move it around the screen, etc., and then pull it back, turn it to a right angle, let go of the switch. Uh, that will usually work. But uh, if you're going to do this and, and uh, do it often, eh, get the right tool. Horizontal flat lines. Horizontal flat lines are a problem with vertical deflection. Remember, you have horizontal deflection because you have a horizontal line. You're missing the vertical deflection. You're missing the part that makes your screen go up and down. Now, this really screws with people's heads when you're dealing with arcade game monitors because arcade game monitors, 4x3 monitors, sit like this in a horizontal position and sit like this in a vertical position. So if they're turned on their side and you have a line going up and down, it's still a vertical deflection problem because the monitor's turned on its side. That blows people's mind. But horizontal lines are normally a problem with vertical deflection. So are you missing that voltage source? Do you have a problem with the vertical output IC or the vertical output transistors? In the case of the 5153, you've got a pair of transistors that are driving the vertical yoke. And if one of those goes bad, you'll have deflection in one direction, not the other. If both go bad, you'll be missing deflection in both, both directions. You could have a problem with capacitors. You could have a problem with cooked solder joints on the yoke connector. Or the yoke connector itself might be turning colors dark because it's burned up the contacts inside it, in which case you need to replace the contacts. A broken vertical size pot. A service switch. What's a service switch for? Anybody? Nobody? A service switch gives you a flat line. And what you do with that is you adjust the color guns on the back of the tube, the neck, you know, where you got the adjustments for the red, green, and blue, the gains, and the cutoffs. 
so that you have a straight, solid, pretty white line with RGB uh, full input. That's what it's for, just for color balancing. But if it's turned on, you have a flat vertical line. The other part of this is turn down the dang brightness. Why? Anyone? You got this really bright vertical or horizontal line on your monitor. What's it going to do? Burn the tube. Yeah, burn the tube. That's bad news. When you, once you buy a prize, it's yours to keep. You burn that tube, you cannot unburn it. The only thing you can do is send it something super bright across the whole screen and try and burn the whole screen uniformly. Now, why would it not be the 115 volt source going into this? You see right here, down at the bottom right, I don't have it marked in yellow. Why is the 115 volt source being ignored for a problem with vertical deflection? As you can see the line on the screen, you got high voltage. Yeah, if you recall, the 115 volts is the main output from the power supply that drives the vertical out or the horizontal output section so that you have high voltage. If this is missing, you have no high voltage, you have no horizontal oscillation running that's going to drive that flyback transformer to give you your high voltage. So if <laughs> that's why we're ignoring it, because if it was missing, you would have other serious problems. Now, it, it's possible that you you could have had a short somewhere that could have taken things out or you know broken vertical center pot, but I would think with your vertical center pot being broken, you're not going to have a flat line on the screen. You're just going to have your, your screen just going to be wonky off center. Vertical, defle vertical lines, horizontal deflection. We have vertical deflection because the line goes up and down. We're missing the horizontal deflection because the line's not going left and right. This is actually a much simpler circuit because coming off of the uh, flyback transformer and uh, the horizontal section, we end up with having a, uh, a transformer, a coil, a capacitor, and connections to the yoke or the yoke itself. Very simple. We have a horizontal centering coil here. And uh, with that, you know, you, you have very few things in here that could go wrong. So when you see a vertical line, you're like, oh, okay, well, I can troubleshoot this one pretty easy. But just beware, if the yoke is open, then you're going to need a new yoke, and that can be hard to find. When monitors fail, people tend to take the yokes off and uh, turn them in for scrap. Vertical hold issues, fairly simple to troubleshoot. Check your vertical hold, check your voltages going in to make sure they're correct. And uh, if your pot's good uh, and the resistor there is good, change out the uh, sync processor. Horizontal hold issues, similarly pretty easy to troubleshoot. You've got a control down here. You've got a couple of caps in the circuit, a couple of resistors, and that sync processor. In the case of the 5153, it's the same part that does horizontal and vertical sync processing. Now, if you're missing both horizontal and vertical, then you're going to check your sync inputs. Now, some of this, if you have absolutely no sync at all for vertical or horizontal, it, it, no matter what you change, you can't get it to change anything on the screen. Make sure your cable's okay coming in. Make sure your sync signal is making it through the cable to the board and getting over here to where it needs to go for that sync section. So if all that checks out good and the parts check out good, then swap the IC. Now, arcing or popping sounds. This one can get a little freaky at times because you, you don't want to be reaching around something that's like if you have a cracked flyback or you have um, a split on the rubber cap going to the second anode, you don't want to be reaching around that because it will shock the crap out of you. Uh, if you have too high a voltage going to the CRT, it should shut down for x-ray protection, but uh, you might also have high voltage, too high a voltage going to certain circuits. You have spark gaps 
on there. Now, sometimes those spark gaps will actually be neon bulbs, but other times they'll be capacitors and you'll, you'll see little blue sparks going across them. Um, look at the neck of the tube. If you see arcing inside the neck or you see a blue glow inside the neck, then it's gassy. It, it's got air in it. It's a bad tube. It's time to swap the tube. If you um, have a total crack and it's totally gassed up, I mean, it's, you know, there's no vacuum at all, you will actually see and hear serious amounts of sparks and large arcs inside the tube. And it is a freaky light show. So when that happens, the tube is definitely bad. Sergio, go ahead. Yeah, I had an uh, issue with uh, the 19-inch monitor from a uh, computer. It said the wire going, going from the flyback to the tube uh, uh, just fell down of its return, return the clips and it was snaking around the PCBs and it was arch arching. I just had to just put, put it back on the, on the plastic clip that was keeping it away from the other electronics. Yeah, it sounds like you need to replace that wire, but the problem is to replace the wire, you have to replace the whole thing. If if the wire itself is, if it's arcing from the side of the wire, then the insulation is broken down. If the end of the wire came out from the gray cap, you have to, you have to discharge the CRT, take the cap off, and strip the wire back just a little bit and solder it back to the metal clip that goes inside that, that uh, mounts to the tube. In any case, whenever you're dealing with high voltage wires like this, you have to take the wires and you have to curl them around each other. And when you solder them, you want it to be a big round blob. No peaks of solder coming off of it because when you have peaks, that's when you have corona discharge, a little glowing around it. And that's where arcs will come from as well. So whenever you solder high voltage, it's got to be a round glob. And then uh, you want to insulate it very well. You've got this uh, substance called Corona Dope, which will help insulate it. And you can also uh, dab it up with uh, some um, high voltage putty, things like that to, uh, to help insulate it. Now, if you have a split rubber cap on the second anode, you can get replacement caps and you just desolder the wire from it and pull the assembly apart and then pull the cap off and then put a new cap on, solder everything back together and then pop it back on. Noisy screen, you won't typically see this on an RGB monitor or a TTL monitor unless the grounds are just totally screwed up on the cable, on the input cable. Uh, you'll typically see this on composite video. Uh, I see a lot of this on Apple's especially the computer itself, where you have the input jack here, and, it, and this is what a replacement jack looks like. I just shamelessly took this picture off my website. But what'll happen is this is just crimped together really tight, and over time it'll loosen up and this barrel will spin in this mount. And you'll sit there and you'll twist your video cable and oh, suddenly you get a beautiful picture again. So what you can do is you can actually take a little bit of sandpaper and sand this, make it look nice and shiny, and then run a bead of solder around this to fuse it all together as one big piece of metal, electrically and physically, and then that'll take care of that input jack problem there. Check your solder where it's soldered to the board here. If it's got cracks like that, you're gonna wanna reflow them and fix it. Uh, check caps, but typically this isn't going to be a cap issue most of the time. Um, but it is still, it can be. It could be something in the video sync separator circuit, a video processor, video amp. Uh, but typically it's going to be something with grounds and something with inputs when you're dealing with those composite video monitors. Color alignment, I am not going to cover this. You have purity magnets, you have convergence magnets, and you adjust these. All I'm going to tell you is, is this little piece right here that clamps the yoke down you don't want to mess with it if you don't have to turn the yoke if the picture's tilted yeah you have to turn the yoke make sure you don't over tighten it and for these magnets right here as you're adjusting those i would highly recommend you take some white out and paint a straight line down all of those rings 
so that you know where to put them back in case you get everything all out of whack and you need to put them back to a place where a known starting point was. This is way beyond the scope of anything for today, so we're just going to skip past it. Finding schematics. Uh, there are service manuals you can get from the manufacturer. You can download them online. Uh, I would highly recommend that uh, you look for specific keywords. Now, which ones of these are going to work and which ones of these are not? Uh, I'm sorry, number four is not going to work. Uh, if you're going to search, you want to get specific with what you're searching for. So you want to put that model, what was it, 4863, if I remember correctly, for the PC Junior monitor in there. So IBM uh, 4863 monitor schematics. Now, SAMS is a third company that would take and reverse engineer things and uh, build schematics and tear down diagrams and and give you information on where to measure for what voltages, what signal should be present on the monitor, etc. And they are great for troubleshooting. They are, they are awesome resources. They are still sold today. Um, you can also go out to the Internet Archive and people have uploaded Sam's photo facts to the Internet Archive. So you can go there and search for those keywords. Um, I would use the green, the search box here circled in green, not the one up top, but the one down here. And search for those keywords. You're going to have to be much more careful with your keywords on the Wayback Machine than you are when you're dealing with Google. So it's going to take time to find things through the Internet Archive. Uh, if somebody's uploaded it, you'll see it there. If you want to search through the old websites up here, be my guest. But And you might find the schematics there. But it's going to take a lot of time to dig through old websites. Finding parts. Start with the manufacturer if you can. If not, go to a company that makes flybacks and does it for a living. HR Demon, uh, they're an Irish company, if I remember correctly. Uh, they can be pricey, but the quality there you get, you're not going to have to worry about it. It's going to work. And you can go in and you can search for the part numbers. And yeah, I did get it right, 4863. So my memory's still still okay. <laughs> Google is your friend, but can sometimes be your enemy. When you're searching for schematics, when you're searching for parts, there are a lot of scummy, scammy websites that will be returned. So be careful in clicking on those. Some of them I would recommend if you want to try to click on them, right click and open it in an incognito window and try and do whatever you can to uh, make sure you stay safe. Also, if there are things that Google's returning that you don't want and they're leaving out keywords you want, put some of those keywords in double quotes. Like when searching TRS-80 CM-5 flyback. Last resorts, eBay. Lots of counterfeits. I would, I would try to never buy semiconductors off of those. So be careful with it. A lot of counterfeits. Uh, retro computing forums, like the VCF forum, those are also very helpful in finding parts. Because you never know who's who's got a hoard of old parts somewhere. You know, they might be crazy like me. I've got a hoard of, of uh, Wise 60 flybacks. Mauser, Digikey, Jameco, Newark, Avnet, other distributors will have almost everything you need. There are third-party sites that you can go to small stores like Anchor Electronics out in uh, California that does a lot of surplus electronics of older stuff that is awesome to do shopping with. Uh, beware of capacitors. If you're buying capacitors for something, you may need to look at some data sheets and find out what you need. A nice cheap pair of calipers is your friend with this because then you can measure the physical size, look at the data sheets and find what you need. For example, the K7000, if I remember right, or was it 7400 monitors have a vertical output IC with a heat sink that is rectangular shaped, kind of like a, a, a bracket you, you see on your keyboard, you know, the bracket key. And right next to that is a capacitor. And you have to order the tall, skinny version of the capacitor 
to fit physically in that circuit even after all these years and the newer caps getting smaller in size. So be careful with that. Sometimes you do need to break out those calipers and look at some data sheets to figure out, is this cap going to physically fit where I need it to? Normally, you don't have to deal with that. Normally, you buy caps, you get them in 105 degrees Celsius. If they're a 16 volt part, you put a 50 volt part in it. It doesn't matter as long as it physically fits. And today, 50 volt parts are the same size as 16 volt parts. Uh, sometimes even smaller than some of the uh, 16 volt parts, depending on the manufacturer and the series. But always stick with 105 C caps when you're dealing with monitors and um, make sure that you install them correctly so you, you they don't go pow. Uh, NTE Inc. NTE is a great company that uh, sells replacement semiconductors that are almost always a good fit. Sometimes you'll find their, their replacements don't work in a circuit. It happens. They're not perfect. But for what you're doing, they are awesome. And they have a program called Quick Cross that you can download from their website. And NTE Quick Cross will give you the ability to come in here and cross-reference something. So we can come in here and we can search and we can say, okay, and uh, let me see, LM... 386, a simple little 8-pin amplifier IC chip. That crosses over to the NTE823, and I can even download a data sheet on it so that I could look to see the pinouts of it and the specs on the product. They also have big paper catalogs for those of you that have been around a while and might remember those. They used to have the paper catalogs at Fry's on the shelf where the NTE parts were, so you could look up stuff there as well. Um, you can also get an app and have it on your phone. I have it on my phone as well. NTE parts, you can find them at Altex here locally. Uh, they have a few pieces at Micro Center, but they're not the replacement semiconductors. They're like resistors and capacitors and some of the things you might need for maker use, some LEDs, but they don't have the whole whole variety of things. So uh, if you need them, I know Altex has them. I don't know of any other place in the Metroplex that has them anymore. But uh, you can go to the NTE website and they'll tell you if somebody does. I think Mauser might have them. So you can do a will call for something like that. Uh, I've been told their will call is back open. So things to remember. Use your senses. Fuses sometimes blow for no other reason than age. Did it break the wire? Or did it completely vaporize and coat the inside of the glass? That's a big difference to tell you between, hey, this is metal fatigue, you know, the fuse just failed, uh, versus I have a short somewhere and I really need to dig into this and find out what's going on. Capacitors and CRT tubes hold a charge for a long time. Uh, back in college, it was a fun thing to charge up a cap and toss it to somebody. You know, if you catch it, you might not be able to let go of it depending on how you catch it. Now, G07, that's a little reminder. G07 arcade game monitors have two fuses in them. One fuse, if it blows, is after the big mains filter cap, which means the mains filter cap is holding a big charge. That thing will melt a screwdriver tip, and it will scare the crap out of you. So, yeah, be careful of capacitors, uh, especially the big ones, and monitors. So if you're unsure, use your voltmeter and check to see if it still has a charge on it. I'll tell you that Dynacomp power supplies on an Apple II Plus or an Apple IIe do not have the 100K, or is it 120K, ohm bleeder resistors across the main capacitors in the power supply. So it comes through the bridge rectifier to these capacitors and they don't have bleeders on them. So you turn it off if the, if the power supply is not running, if it's in shutdown, then those capacitors are going to hold a charge for a while because they, they don't have the bleeder resistors. It took about 15, 17 years for the three little scars to fade off my left hand from grabbing a Dynacomp power supply that fell off the bench that had charged capacitors and I could not let go of it. That hurt. Crack solders, not always easiest to spot. Magnification, magnification and light helps. 
you know, if you can, if you shine a light on it, use your jeweler's loop, magnifying glass, that'll help you see it. If you have a crack in the circuit board, light helps you see it. Resistors don't go down in value when damaged. When you have a short circuit, resistors don't short out. They go up in value. They limit current. They burn out. This is why shorted semiconductors don't always blow fuses because the resistors limit the current. You might find a resistor getting red hot. You might even see it smoking a bit. So look down circuit from it to see what is drawing all that current that's causing it to get hot like that. Diodes and semiconductors can go leaky. They can go open. The only time I've ever seen a semiconductor go open was uh, when you had a, um, a problem with physical contamination, you know, battery leakage, and it migrated up the leads inside the body of the part. Uh, but they still can go open. You know, they have little wires inside them that connect those leads to the die, and so those wires can go open. Uh, but they also can go leaky. I had a uh, 20 megahertz oscilloscope. I bought 13 oscilloscopes from an auction lot, tested all of them out, fixed all but one, sold them all. The one last one was a bit of a pain in the butt, but I finally tracked it down to a leaky diode in the focus assembly that was causing the screen to bloom super bright and be way out of focus. What had happened was the diode went leaky. So it conducted easily forward, but was partially conducting backwards when, when it shouldn't. It's rare, but it, it can always happen. And the last one is be very aware of where your other hand is because you don't want current going across your heart you also want to make sure that you don't have too many hands in the way. If you get shocked, shocked burnt, or something happens in the circuit if, and something goes pop and you're jerking your hand back at the speed of lightning, you don't want to be jerking two hands back at the speed of lightning. And so we are at the end. So now that you've gone through this, you should be able to identify functional circuitry blocks in the monitor, be able to look at the silk screen and understand you know, what parts go with what section of that monitor to help you with understanding how to troubleshoot those circuit blocks and find the problems that are blowing fuses, shutting down the switching power supplies, or that are causing the problems that you're seeing on the screen of the monitor. And you should be able to order some of the parts for your monitor to help replace them. So some additional resources for you. These are all places to order parts. Online Components has great cap prices when you're in bulk. Mauser and Allied Electronics are in local to the DFW area. Uh, Mauser has a will call window that's open. Allied has a will call window. I don't know for sure if it's open or not. Future Electronics, they're global. They can get hard to find stuff. Uh, when other people are out of things, they can usually pull a rabbit out of the hat somewhere globally. And I've ordered things from them and have never gotten a counterfeit part. They always look at the chain of custody of these parts. So they've been great to deal with. Their website's a little wonky, and you'll look at that and go, is that really a real company? But they are. They're great. Uh, if you want to learn more about arcade game CRT repairs, there's a lot of tutorials out there at randyfrom.com. So go out and look at Randy's website, uh, HR Demon for your flybacks, and Sam's uh, website, for the uh, photo facts and computer facts. You can download a lot of the SAM stuff online, but they really shouldn't be available for download. So, uh, you know, like everything else, I recommend you, you going back to uh, the uh, uh, manufacturer and, and help keep them in business. And so that brings us to the last slide I've got. Uh, we're about nine minutes over, so any questions, uh, y'all feel free to come off mute. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and just turn it into a free-for-all.